Hello everyone, this is Rich and you are watching Indie Plus. This is one of our monthly panels. This panel has a bunch of experts in a cool thing called Games on Demand. Uh, Games on Demand has been featured in a number of uh, conventions, like meat space conventions for gaming, and we're going to learn all about it. Uh, this, just so you know, Indie Plus, uh, this this panel upholds the Indie Plus community standards. And if you want to find out more about those, you can uh, just find our website, IndiePlus.org. And also, if you're interested in future conversations, please do join our Google Plus community. We, uh, we're having a little membership drive, and we would love to have you join that community. Please be aware that uh, this event may include explicit language. I'm not entirely sure, uh, as some of these people are new to me, so they may, they may curse, and so be advised, and children, be advised, because uh, that could happen. All right, you've been warned. Now I'm going to uh, introduce each of our panelists uh, after I give you a quick... So Games on Demand, again, is a, is a situation where at a convention like Gen Con, Origins, PAX, uh, and a number of other smaller cons have also had games on demand where some GMs get together and it's effectively like open slots where they will offer a small number of games that they're ready to run and people can come up, pay some generic tickets, and they can demand those games uh, from the menu that's on offer. And so that's, that's generally what we'll be talking about tonight. But I think there's some different permutations and there's a, a lot of behind-the-scenes stuff we're going to get on games on demand tonight, so I'm pretty excited about that. So first, let me introduce everyone. What I'm going to do is we're going to, it's going to be a little bit lengthy on the introduction. I'm going to introduce each person starting alphabetically by first name because that's how they appear on my Hangout window. And I want each of you, as I introduce you, if you could just tell me a little bit like either a cool moment that's happened for you during a Games on Demand or what it is that you get out of the Games on Demand that, that makes it worth your, your volunteering effort because uh, some might say that it's a little bit of a thankless job to have all those screaming gamers throwing generic tickets at you and, and yelling about the game they want to get in. So we'll start off with Evan Torner, who's the guy in the black hat and a freeform aficionado. How are you doing, Evan? I'm doing very well, thank you. Well, cool. So walk me through. Why is it that you do this thing? Oh, God. I think Games on Demand happens for me because it lets me run the games I love for, for people... Uh, off the street, more or less, and uh, allows me to be really enthusiastic for them, which which is the thing that we encourage most, enthusiasm. Absolutely. Very cool, very cool. All right, well, next we have Kristen Firth, who is uh, an improv enthusiast, uh, also a game designer, and she plays the best cat that I've ever seen, uh, but a very evil cat. So, Kristen, how are you, and, uh, and so why do you do this thing? Uh... Well, I'm going to answer both parts of your questions and be a little longer than Evan, uh, but a cool moment that I had, um, I was once jamming at PAX East, and uh, I typically, I help organize uh, games on at Gen Con, so that's my usual crowd, and PAX East was a little bit different, but I uh, ran Zombie Cinema late one night for this group of people that had, I think, only ever played board games together, and they just come by, like, it was this group of six people that play board games all the time, and they were like, we want to try out this thing, and so I ran Zombie Cinema for them, and they were so excited by it. They immediately wanted to buy copies, and uh, I think it was IPR it was one of those booths and just shut down. But like I walked over and I was like, "Hey, they want to buy copies," and he came over with a stack of them. <laughs> Two of them bought the game, and they were like converts. Uh, and this is kind of the magic that can can happen at, at Games on Demand. Um, so that's that's my cool moment. Um, but why what I get out of it and why I keep coming back is uh, it's basically like family to me uh, when I'm trying to explain this crazy thing that I do to coworkers and other people that don't really understand the gaming world. I, I say it's like a family reunion. <laughs> every every year we get together, it's the same people. We're, we're back together again. Um, and that's that's sort of what keeps me keeps me involved, my family reunion every year. Nice, nice. Very cool. Well, uh, next we have Natalie Holt, who organized the Games on Demand at PAX and Emerald City Comic Con this year. How are you, Natalie? And uh, why do you do this thing? Hello, I'm great. Um, I think the thing that I love most about Games on Demand is just um, having people fall in love with gaming. Um, people who either have never played a game before or have only played more traditional role-playing games and, and kind of got sick of them coming back around. Um, that's the best part, especially if you can get like a group of friends together who just you know go wild and have a great time, and they're like, "We're gonna do this every day when we get back home," you know, and that's my favorite part of it, and that's probably the thing. 
getting together with people and playing games is great too. You know, seeing everybody. I agree, it's kind of like a reunion. You get to see all your cool friends you don't see all the time. But um, yeah, I just like to see people having a good time. And I like organizing things, so <laughs> I get to like feed that. <laughs> it's, a, it's an interesting Venn diagram. <laughs> <laughs> having fun and organizing. Uh, Renee Knife, uh, how are you, game designer, a horror expert, and a frequent games on demand team? I saw it, Origins, Renee, like, was always at a different table running for a huge amounts of people. Um, yeah, that. I'm, I also did the Gen Con organization team this year, so it's kind of been a progression for me. And uh, it's kind of interesting because I was never going back to Gen Con. I was never going back to Origins. Um, I hadn't been since the, the early 2000s, and I just wasn't going back. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of reasons for that, I often don't have super great gaming experiences at conventions. Also, gaming conventions are predominantly um, cis-centric, predominantly male-centric. Um, not that there isn't a substantial queer population uh, blended into that, but it just didn't really feel like a place that I was for me anymore. Um, and then, actually, I ended up back at Gen Con in 2012 because I had a film that uh, was uh, accepted into their film festival. So I figured I should probably go. Um, I dropped by the Games on Demand room the Wednesday night during uh, their meeting just to, because it's an extension of my G Plus friends. And as soon as I walk into the room, you know, John Stavropoulos has me in a bear hug. Um, you know, Joe Beeson is there. Um, Kristen, a million people that I know from G+, and immediately, like Kristen said, it was like you'd walked into a family reunion. Um, and like being here tonight, it's like seeing family again. So um, so that year, you know, I just I played at Games on Demand. I ended up kind of running a game. Next year, I volunteered uh, to a GM. This most recent Gen Con, I was on the, organi the organizer's team. Um, yeah, it's just... It's a welcoming environment, and as far as like best moments that I can point to, they're all really personal, um, personal things, um, like my relationship with Ajit George that has grown out of there that I'm not going to go into on air, but everybody who sort of knows Ajit and I kind of know how um, that wouldn't exist without the Games on Demand family. And likewise, um, you know, I've I've dragged friends along who. It's their story to tell, but they found the same welcoming environment that I have and have since joined the Games on Demand team. And interestingly, that's actually made us closer in a way while becoming a really big part of their life. It's just such a welcoming, friendly, family sort of environment for us. So, Well, thank you, Renee. That, that's, that's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, next, we have Ross Cohen, a designer of Fall of Magic, Serpent's Tooth, Life on Mars, and a bunch of others. Uh, how are you doing, Ross? I'm I'm unmuted. Oh, your your audio just cut out, Ross. And it's okay. I'm back. <laughs> okay, you're good. Um, yeah, I um, I'm doing really good. That was the question, right? Yeah, so then if you could kind of walk us through, what do you do this crazy thing? Oh yeah, you can't say favorite yeah. union. It's been taken. No, no, I I love uh, Games on Demand is awesome. Um, so I was introduced to Games on Demand through PAX, and PAX is nuts. It's just like there's hundreds of thousands of people there. Uh, you know, just the the video game industry just like descends. Like Wizards of the Coast is there, and it's just. Uh, there's just all there's all the crazy uh, politics around the, you know the the founders of PAX constantly like saying really stupid stuff every year. Uh, they're not the last two years, you know, like you know fingers crossed. <laughs> and I've had a lot of people come up to me uh, at the end of PAX, um, including this year we brought a whole bunch of folks from the Olympia story game community who had never uh, who had never been to PAX before and. We get and like these people come up to me and they're like, you know what, Games on Demand was actually my favorite part of PAX, and that's kind of nuts because there are some intense, uh, intense. There's like an intense amount of money 
being dropped on packs to try and get people's attention. You know, there's this year there's a huge like statue of Ulamog like bursting out of the Washington Convention Center and like crushing this cop car and smoke going everywhere. And you know, there's it's it's just this cacophony of stuff trying to get your attention and it's so lovely that there's this place that you can go and you know that the people that are putting it on are putting a lot of energy into making it a safer space and you know you um, you get to have this experience where it's going to be personal you're it's you're going to be really seen and you're really going to be witnessed and you're going to just sit down with some people for a couple hours in the midst of all this in this kind of quiet room with some nice curtains and and create a story together and um, it's really beautiful and I think that it's really beautiful to have something like that happen at a place like PAX where um, you know a, a lot of folks are used to coming at games as just being this passive entertainment you know just um, you, you know they're not really caring about you it's they, they except they want your money you know this this really kind of um, uh, uh, capitalist driven uh, b business model and um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm just really stoked to be a part of PAX uh, every year. Excellent. Thanks, Ross. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, I think we have the, the aged elder uh, doing like, you've done this for like 15 years, isn't that right, Steve? Steve yeah. Sege of uh, Bully Pulpit Games. How are you doing, Steve? I'm great. Great. Thanks for organizing this. It's fantastic to see everybody. Um, yeah, everything that everyone has said it pretty much sums up why I'm still doing this. Uh, the the community, the um, support for people who are at a convention and lost, looking for something to do, looking for new things or new connections. Um, what Renee was saying about this, you know, never wanting to come back to Gen Con again, I hear it all the time. You know, people who come and they look around and they're not quite sure how to do anything and everything. I mean, Gen Con's huge. People are siloed into all the different places where the board games happen, where the miniatures happen, where card games happen. So it's, it can be difficult to find out what you want and in getting into it. Uh, by the time anybody gets on the ground at Gen Con, all the tickets that are available have been bought. All the games are full. People have, who know what they're doing get into them months in advance. So you get to Gen Con and you kind of wander around for four days trying to figure out what to do and where your place is. And uh, I did that in 2006 and again in 2007, and then I started looking around and realizing that that didn't work, that you needed to have a, a place, you needed to have a focal point for your experience at a convention, especially a big one. And so um, I wasn't the first person to organize Games on Demand. It was happening for years before I got involved, but when I started, I looked at it and I thought, this is a thing that needs more support because it is central to our community, or it could be. Uh, the way I talk about it now is that it it's, it sits on three legs. Uh, it is something that w one purpose is to bring in new people and expose them to the kinds of games that we think are great. Uh, one of them is to create a, a focal point for our community, for the indie gaming community largely, uh, and give us all a place to see each other. And then the last point, you know, I'm with Bully Pulpit Games, and so something that's important to me is supporting the various publishers. Um, so we are a connection to those publishers, to those retailers, uh, and so that those things are all very important to me, all three of those. Um, and my experience is every year getting to see those people come back. As Renee said, people come for the first time just to see what it's about, and they say, this is great. And the next year they come back to run games, and then they say, hey, this is really cool, I want to do more. Uh, and every year our community grows because more people are getting involved. So I think that's... Um, that's the part that's really exciting for me. That's why I keep doing it. Thanks, Steve. You know, one of the initial questions that we had was, you know, what kind of animal is Games on Demand anyway? I think that really breaks it down. But Evan, did you have anything you want to add? Sure. Uh, the boring answer to that is, is, is it's effectively a convention within a convention. We are definitely organizing a sub-convention that uh, functions and like a sort of symbiote, I won't say a parasite, off the... Um, original convention uh, with our own registration policies, etc. Um, on the other hand, uh, I would call us a soft huggy cult, and I'll explain why I call us a soft huggy cult. Um, I call it soft because we are a soft sell organization. We come, we don't try and sell people on the idea, we just say come and play some games. Um, 
huggy because John Stavropoulos will hug you eventually, and then you know you're you're in the community. And uh, the cult is actually, I think, the most important part, which is uh, we play with people as if they were our friends, even though sometimes they are they are people who are just off the street. And that that's extremely important uh, that we. Uh, are looking to everyone we're playing with as a potential future game master and organizer. So almost anyone that we're bringing in could be a Renee Knipe, you know, who will then suddenly be on the organizing team for, uh, for, for, for Gen Con or for Origins or, or for PAX East. And so um, everybody can definitely enter and participate, and we want to infect them with the enthusiasm that we already have for the games and for the community. Thanks, Evan. Uh, any anyone else had any, any thoughts on on that kind of what the heck is games on demand? I think that wraps it pretty well, right? Good. Cool. So the next question was submitted by Marshall Miller, and just as a quick, uh, I do have Q and A on. So if you're watching this live and you've got a burning question that you want to know about that hasn't been submitted uh, already, feel free to let us know. Otherwise, uh, did submit for questions before this hangout and people who follow Indie Plus did provide us with some intriguing questions. I want to get to the really hard ones soon. I want to start off with Steve specifically because he has the website for Games on Demand. Does anyone, Marshall Miller wanted to know, does anyone own the Games on Demand branding? You know, how do you buy into the franchise and, and get the cool hats and the fry boxes? Like, how does yeah. that go, Steve? So... Games on Demand is very loosely organized. Uh, it's, it's as Evan said, it's run entirely on enthusiasm. Uh, if people were not really enthusiastic about uh, the games and the community, then they wouldn't take the time to come to the conventions, wouldn't go through all of that expense. Uh, so we don't have a lot of hard organization. It's more like chapters. Uh, Gen Con is one, Origins is another. And the people that are involved in those chapters organize it in their own individual ways. The way the branding has come up is just over the years, we've tried to centralize things a little bit uh, through volunteer efforts, create that branding, uh, refine it each year, apply it to different shows. So, uh, yeah, I run the website, which is IndieGamesOnDemand.org. And what I've tried to do is to get everybody who's running an event to give me content to put on that site so that there's a central place where everything lives. Um, a lot of the branding efforts have come from work that Jason Morningstar has done in terms of the menus that we use and uh, the, the logos that we use on the site. Um, but again, it, it can come from all over. Will Heinmarch has done a lot to help us out making banners uh, to, to have standing at the shows. Um, <clears throat> I think, uh, gosh, I can't even remember all the different sources for things that we've used. It's a, you know, it's a big community full of people who are really trying hard to make it great. Um, the way to get involved is generally to contact us through the website or to reach out to us on the, uh, the through the community on Google Plus, um, and just to say, hey, we're starting up a, you know, we have a show in this small convention in you know, uh, the Twin Cities, and we want to we see what you're doing with Games on Demand, and we think it's great, and we want to do that here. How do we get started? Uh, and I'll usually give them some basic advice about how to work with the organizers at the convention how to get things up, and then if they want to put things on the website, um, we can do that. If they want to use the menus, we can send them the files. So it's, you know, just ask. Now, that sounds pretty good, but Natalie, you just set up Emerald Comic Con. How did it really go? <laughs> so we got the official answer. So Natalie, you're, you, you, it's you the most recent that we have on here who set somebody up. Do you have any uh, feedback on how it went for you? Yeah, I, mean, I did PAX and Emerald City Comic Con, and they both went pretty well. Uh, I just, you got to get in touch with whoever is doing the tabletop, I guess, is the first step. And then from there, it's just um, make sure you're getting badges, make sure you're getting whatever you need, and then you can start kind of tapping volunteers. I think someone had, I don't know if this is jumping forward, I think someone had asked a question about which way you should do it. And I think definitely talk to the con and get your like ducks in a row, and then you can go look for volunteers because you don't want to promise people stuff that you can't deliver on. So um, from there, once you know what you're getting and once you kind of like, and if, I, from my, I, my point of view is, you know, you're, since we're providing kind of a value to the convention, you should always not be afraid to ask 
for things that will um, improve the experience for you for the convention. Ask for a good space. Ask for signage if they'll provide it. Uh, get yourself some pipe and drape. <laughs> you know, just go for it. Go for broke. And uh, the worst they can do is say no. So um, Emerald City Comic Con, we got a we got a pretty like decent spot with some foot traffic and um, some tables that were set aside for us, so we didn't have to fight people in a free play area. And then you just get all, I don't know, just set up a Google spreadsheet, get all your volunteers to send in their information, and uh, make sure that they all come get badges, get kind of oriented. I think the most important thing for me is, like, this is something I'm still, like, trying to perfect, is having a really, like, getting really awesome people on the table, because that's, like, your first line for people who are coming up who don't know what Games on Demand is. So you want someone who can explain it well, someone who knows the games, and I think it's someone who can read people is really important because a lot of people aren't going to understand, like, what is this, what do you mean by diceless, what do you mean by jamless, what do you mean by this and this? Like, people who play these games, they understand everything. We, we know what all this means. We know what an apocalypse, the apocalypse world system is. I think you just got to talk to people and figure out what are they looking for, and that's how you get people into the right game. This is was this the question you asked? I'm just going on and on. <laughs> this is just it was the the setup definitely was the question I wanted to know about. I know Renee, you just set up uh, or you're, you're setting up Yukon, right? Uh, Yukon in Ann Arbor. You want to well, talk a little bit about that? I'm sort of consulting with the folks at Yukon. Um, in a way, so the games on demand branding to just talk about that. I mean, it's a it's people know it, and it's it has sort of a a powerful ring to it. When you hear games on demand, it sort of means something. But it kind of means something different to different people, and that's sort of what I'm experiencing right now. And, and uh, so, like, with UConn, we actually were approached uh, on Google Plus by the UConn um, coordinators who wanted to get games on demand there. They had somebody that they were going to put in charge of uh, sort of moderating it, but they didn't know what to do or or they'd never done anything with games on demand before um, really so myself and my roommate and another friend of ours threw in our uh, our hats in to sort of help and, and consult but you were running into that thing and I want to be careful because I want I don't want to say something wrong or or anything um, but I don't think it's going to look very much like what we've seen at origins like what we've seen at Gen Con and so that's a thing is, in a way, we're a victim of our own branding, except not victim's the wrong word, because obviously this is a good program to have at any convention. Um, but if you're going to a certain con, you expecting a certain thing, it may not end up being that thing. We've heard some people just recently returned from Dragon Con, um, for, ex for example, who uh, talked about games on demand and how it was not what they were expecting. So there's a thing, there's a part of me that kind of wishes our branding, our mission statement was a little, a little stronger, that we had a little stronger organization for that. But that might also be me just not being willing to let go of what I love so much about the Gen Con and Origins games on demand. So. Well, from personal experience, anyone who goes to Dragon Con looking for RPGs, really, you're at the wrong place. <laughs> like, I've been there five times, and I've never... It, there was a point when White Wolf was like hard, hot and heavy and Justin Achille and Evan, uh, Ethan Scamper running games. From that moment forward, it has not been a place for role-playing games. So I blame the con. They do yeah. not support it. And, and that's sort of what I had heard, too, is that they just have a really tight rein on everything. So a, a lot of it depends on, on the convention organizers and what they're willing to do. And my experience, my understanding from Dragon Con is that they're not gaming focused so they don't really understand how to meet our needs for the people that have tried to organize that. Yeah, although humble brag, uh, I did get to play in a, a vampire game that Justin Achille ran and a werewolf game that Ethan Skin ran. It was freaking amazing. But anyway, <laughs> it was not games on demand. I just said, please, please, Lord, please run this game for me. Uh, so now we have another question. Um, so the question that, that we have also from Marshall Miller, and I think it, it dovetails really well for this. Kristen, I want to tap you to start this off. In organizing a Games on Demand event, 
Um, and, and Alex already kind of touched into this as well, but, but let, let me know, uh, what are the roles that you try to fill? We've got a greeter, so what, you get somebody who's retired, really old, and they just kind of stand out there and talk to people. That's what greeters do. No, no. Go ahead, Kristen. <laughs> Educate. Yeah, so, so I'm going to tell you about uh, Gen Con, which I believe is the biggest Games on Demand. Uh, so we've got a lot going on, and not every convention that wants to start a Games on Demand is going to need this. So this will, this will sort of be the, the, the most that people currently need. Uh, and of course, we can always do more. Uh, but uh, we start with uh, a main organizer or two. Steve mostly fills that role. Um, I'm, I'm sort of taking on more responsibility myself recently, um, and there's a few people who've been doing games on demand at Gen Con for a while. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of delegation that needs to happen and people under them doing things uh, well before you even get to the con. So uh, you need somebody who's interfacing with the convention. Uh, all the things that Natalie mentioned earlier, making sure you have a space, that kind of thing, badges, uh, all those sort of behind-the-scenes logistics of just dealing with convention staff to give our, our little place a home. Uh, and then on our side, uh, we need to get organized. Uh, we have um, game menus at Gen Con and at a few of the other cons, too. I know Origins had these and some other places where when people come up to the table to figure out what game is next, there's this fancy little menu and we have a template. So in order to make that happen, there needs to be a volunteer recruitment way ahead of time. Those volunteers need to be asked, hey, what games are you running? Fill them out in this template so someone who can make a survey, that kind of thing. Uh, and then you need someone to take all that information and put it in the fancy menus. Renee did that for us at Gen Con this year, which is a very big job. <laughs> um, and then print out the menus and maybe laminate them. So, you know, that might be a couple people with us, but it could be four or five different people if you wanted to sort of separate out that work. Uh, and that's just to get the games visible so people know what they're choosing from. Uh, once you have those game people willing to run games, you need to know when they're going to be scheduled. Uh, even though it's on demand for the players, it's very much scheduled on our side to kind of organize the chaos. So you have to send out a survey and ask when people are available to run games and then make a big master schedule. And that's sort of my, my main job at Gen Con. Um, and that, that takes quite a bit of time. We schedule about 80 or so GMs into a big matrix of, of times that they're running and being at specific uh, places for amounts of time. Uh, and then hosts. Oh, I think what you were calling greeters, uh, we call hosts, but those are people at the uh, front of the table that when people come up and say, what is this thing? What's happening? Uh, you can explain to them. Uh, you also need people, at least in a, our event, which is quite big, that can sort people into games. The way we run is every two hours we start a new batch of games. Uh, and ideally we have three or four hosts out there that during that kind of ten minutes before the two hour slot and ten minutes after are getting crowds of people, up to hundreds of people, into a bunch of games and different tables. Um, so it can get a little bit chaotic, so you need people who are both good at that talking, socializing that Natalie is mentioning, but then also people with kind of a logical brain who can like pattern match and deal with numbers and things, so you kind of need all sorts uh, of personalities out front. Um, and yeah, we, we, we're still working on that. We, we really love our hosts. Uh, if anybody's listening to this and thinking they don't want to be a GM but they want to be a host, we'd love to have you. We, we also have people who just host for us and don't GM. It's not just about the GMing part. Uh, what else? What did I miss? Printouts. We have all kinds of printouts. I mentioned the menus, but we also do little things like maps. We have a diversity statement and safety instructions on every table. Somebody needs to bring those. It's big signs that we print out, things like that. Um, Ideally, outreach to get more volunteers. We started doing a little bit more of that at this Gen Con. Um, yeah, that's a lot. Marketing. <laughs> so people, yeah, I think I think it covered a lot of things. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, once you're at the con, it's it's all about the the hosts and the people running games and making sure it goes as smoothly as possible to get players into games every two hours. And that's uh, that's definitely Gen Con is on the upper end of the scale. It's been yeah. it, where Games on Demand started, and it's it's the one that's been going for a lot of years. And it and as she said, it it supports a lot of people. We need eighty or more volunteers to seat hundreds and hundreds of people through the course of the show. On the other end, I think I think Origins is catching up to that. I think Origins is getting big really fast. Uh, I think that PAX Prime and PAX East are about the same and a little bit behind Origins. Um, and then a smaller show might be as few as four to six tables and, you know, half a dozen volunteers running it. So it can really scale quite a bit. Uh, just, just a word on Origins. Uh, one of the reasons why people seem to come to us for games is that we're a much more of a slow food approach than Gen Con, right? Where, where every 
by, by necessity, every two hours you need to fill tables just because of how hectic people's Gen Con schedules are. And Origins, we block people out into four hours regardless if, if, if whether or not they're going to run a two-hour game or not and, and give them plenty of time for lunch and dinner. And we have nice restaurants in the North Market nearby in Columbus, Ohio. So it's very important that, uh, that people just take their time and, and enjoy the games that they have. And in doing so... This has gotten a lot of random people to come, and now we're we're bursting at the seams. And Jenny's ice cream. They have Jenny's ice cream at Origins as well. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's very good ice cream. Uh, all right. Um, I want to I want to jump to another question to kind of wrap up the whole big part of organization. Uh, this also came from Marshall Miller as well as Paul Edson. Uh, is there any after-action documentation collected and made available on uh, Games on Demand uh, events? And and where does that live? Natalie, what, what about you? Did you do any... Uh, you said you really like documentation, so so hit me out. How did you do that? Oh, you're, you're muted, Natalie. I am. I love documentation. Yes, I do. I collect... Um, I collect information on what games were run, how many people played it, what time... Uh, it's just something that we note in the log, and I mean we keep track of the volunteers and the shifts they worked. Um, I don't know about there was also, I guess the question about diversity. I don't know if that means the volunteers or. Um, uh, well, the the questions like uh, organize, organizer and volunteer participation. Yeah. Diversity, the principle that is a, a little weird, uh, really oddly phrased question. Just um, I don't know if you want to necessarily take mark that. So. Okay. Yeah. I just. I mean. I don't like. Um. I mean, you could always use a more diverse group. I don't know that. I mean, I don't like keep. What their, backgrounds or orientations or anything like that is, but. I don't think that that. I think that it's great to reach out and do that get more diverse people if you can do that, but it's also a matter of just the culture of nerddom and people feeling comfortable coming to conventions, so it's not entirely in our hands, that kind of thing, I feel. I mean, we can all do better. I don't know. <laughs> I, I shouldn't have even talked about that. I was <laughs> just reading the question. I have a brief thought about that. Go ahead, Ross. Um, yeah, and I think what Natalie is saying is it's, it's, it's true. It's a little challenging to gauge the diversity of the participants, and as an organizer, you, you don't have a lot of power there. Where you do have power is in uh, the diversity of the, uh, of the staff of Games on Demand and the diversity uh, present within the actual games that you're offering. So if you are an organizer looking and and you should be looking to um, help support diversity, that's where you need to be looking. Thank you. Thank you. Evan, um, what about for Origins? Any, like, number tracking or documentation on after action that, that you do? I have a sheet of paper that I write down with each slot, what gets run, uh, how many players... Uh, you know, what general games are running, et cetera. There was one year where I was pretty, I think it was two years ago, where I was pretty much able to determine that two-thirds of the games that we ran were either Apocalypse World hacks or Fate. Um, and, and that can only happen when you, uh, when you track things. Um, whether or not these numbers will be useful to someone in the long term, I don't know. But I think, um, I, I definitely know a lot of game designers and game publishers uh, look at that sort of thing. And other than that, um, you know, we're we're basically looking at um, it, from an organizer standpoint, um, are the numbers holding fairly steady across slots? Which means that should we cram more GMs in a slot or not? So, for example, Friday night and Saturday night at Origins, I need to mobilize 12 to 15 GMs, whereas for morning slots, I probably don't need more than seven, and that's usually what we're looking at when we're looking at the numbers. Cool. Kristen, is an after action for Gen Con. You just, like, basically walk away at that point, burn everything yeah, yeah. down. <laughs> no, uh, Jeremy Friesen, who um, handles, 
he's kind of in charge of hosting um, and, and keeping everything glued together during the con. Uh, he, we have a big binder that he walks away with, and then he diligently types everything up for us, which is great. Uh, so yeah, we have similar numbers for Gen Con. Uh, I think they're posted on the, the Google Plus community that we have um, and things like that. So it, it's sort of similar information, I think, to what Evan collects. We have uh, the name of the GM, what game was run, how many players, uh, which slot. And then in next year, similarly, when I'm figuring out the schedule on how many GMs we want to book, we base it on how many games we filled last year and maybe plan for growth if we have enough volunteers. But it hel helps us keep going. Yeah, I think you should plan for growth. Gen Con, you should just go ahead and plan for growth. Yeah. Uh, all right. Oh, sorry, go ahead. So I was just going to say, yeah, we've grown every year. We've been running it, uh, moving into bigger and bigger rooms. So, yeah, it is a popular thing. Um, we also uh, typically put the stats that we do for Gen Con and uh, for Origins Proxies, we try to put them on the website. I'm looking now and realizing that we hadn't, haven't done that yet for Gen Con, but it's usually just the anonymized data of what games got run and how frequently, how many people we served, that sort of thing. And it was, all, it was all Apocalypse World and Fate there too, right? It varies year by year, but yeah, there's a lot of that. We try and convince people when we uh, recruit GMs, we try and tell them that we want them to run a variety of games. Uh, we tell publishers not to run their own games exclusively, to pick other people's games to include. We try and encourage them to pick games that are um, by women or people of color or it, otherwise representing diversity so that the players will get a, a broader selection. And I think we've improved that. If it's not perfect, we've tried to make it so. Yeah. I saw some I saw some stuff out of left field at Origins that, that delighted me, so that's, yeah. that's pretty cool. Um, all right, so, Ross, I'm going to lead off with you. We're going to transition out of the whole broad, like, this is a big thing, and a little more practical, like, for some of the people who might actually say, well, this thing already exists. Maybe I want to run some games. So Lowell Francis asked... As a Games on Demand GM, how do you pick your games in the sense of putting two together to pick from? Because the menu usually has just two options, right? Sure, uh, sure. Do you ever find yourself regretting those choices later and wanting to run <laughs> one over the other? Um, Why don't you well, pick inspectors? No, go ahead, Ross. Sure. Well, I always tell people whenever they're facilitating games to make sure that you're choosing games that you're genuinely excited to play about or to play. Um, I think another consideration is that if you are a game designer or a game publisher, to make sure that uh, that you're offering two games and that one of the games that you're offering is not something that you're um, personally involved with. Uh, also, if you are uh, you know somebody like me, like a straight cis white dude, um, try and run something. You know, you should really be running something. Uh, you know, that supports diversity and really be using your your privilege to advocate. For uh, people that don't, that maybe don't have uh, all that access to visibility that, that you have, um, yeah, and like everything, everything that Steve said, I really agree with as well. Thanks, Ross. Renee, what about you? When when you were figuring out your menu selections, what do you, what do you go through? Well, well, I think Ross said the the really key thing is you have to pick something you're really excited about. I made a couple mistakes the first couple of years, um, particularly at Gen Con Origins, or Gen Con Games on Demand, where I had some games that sounded cool in, on paper, but when I got there, I didn't really want to run them. Um, and fortunately, we just sort of crossed those off the list and move on. <laughs> um, like, for me, decide it's I, I want to play games, because gaming is playing for me, so... I want to play games that maybe I don't get to play as much at home, but at the same time it can't be a game that I'm completely unfamiliar with because I don't want to go in cold and give people a, a terrible experience. Um, so it's good, you know. So this year that ended up being The Warren and uh, Dungeon Crawl Classics were my games, um, games that I haven't gotten to play a lot, but games that I could give a good experience. Um, but to kind of go back to what Steve was talking about and also what Ross was talking about is. We, we had a really big initiative this year to, to have indie game designers, and particularly diverse indie game designers, submit to us their, their games. And we had a, a tremendous list of them, and we encouraged our game masters to look at these games and to pick from these games. I don't know that we ever went back and, and precisely figured out how many at Gen Con um, actually ran those games, but I don't think it was quite the, the saturation we wanted. And part of that's because, you know, it is hard for people to 
to run a game that they've never heard of and provide a good experience. So um, I think maybe we need more of a... And I see Steve in the in the chat saying yes, yes. Um, I think we need, need more of a long tail on that maybe this year, and we should... I know that we're planning on talking earlier this year about our organization efforts so that we can maybe get um, more exposure for games that aren't necessarily um, the things that... Um, we've seen a lot of in the past. So hopefully cross our fingers. Very cool. Natalie, what about you? Any advice for people trying to pick their mini selections or thoughts along those lines? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh I think, you know, I we're not the only ones who do this, but yeah, just print out some blank menus and if you don't feel like it, just run something else. <laughs> <laughs> Nice, short and sweet. Uh, Krista, did you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, we, we do the same thing at Gen Con. We have uh, both laminated and unlimited menus that uh, GMs will sometimes, they, first of all, they can cross off games they don't want to play anymore for a particular slot, or if they come up with a new idea. Um, and sometimes we'll get GMs that didn't volunteer ahead of time, and if we have room in a next slot, we can, we can put them in for that too. Uh, but also people were talking about the, the diversity in the games we were trying to get. I wanted to specifically give a nod out to uh, our many games. Uh, it's ourmanygames.blogspot.com, and there's a, a bunch of designers who have submitted kind of games there and quick start guides and things like that. Uh, it's meant to be a resource for finding games produced by a, a diverse uh, set of people um, and to be able to like pick up those games and start running them more quickly. Uh, I know, I don't remember exactly what we had at Gen Con, if we had anything, but I remember I was at Origins and seeing like there was actually a good folder of a lot of the printouts and things like that. And I know we at least pointed our GMs to them um, from the Gen Con side. So uh, it's also a good resource for anybody thinking about running these games or running games on demand and giving these to your, your GMs. Cool. Thank you. Evan, did you have any uh, anything to add on there? Yeah. Um, some games run better than others at conventions. So you have this sort of cross section or Venn diagram between what you're really enthusiastic about and what will actually run in the space, which is something you just sort of experience and learn over time. So uh, because of the way that we were having trouble pitching LARPs with exact player counts at Gen Con 2014, we then started uh, the Golden Cobra contest in the fall um, of, of, of 2014. And that was specifically to, de to develop live action games that would be able to sell, or rather we would be able to uh, run at, at Gen Con. And lo and behold, because there were not a lot of people who sort of designed variable um, player live action games that could be played in public spaces, um, most of the winners and the best games in that contest were designed by women. Um, and, and I actually think that, that the, the contest helped, like, you know, level the playing field just a little bit insofar as making design... Uh, specifically for event conventions and specifically for games on demand of key things. So I think games on demand is actually also retroactively affecting how we design and implement games and game contests. Will there be a new Golden Cobra this year? Yes. Exciting. <laughs> Exciting. All right. Uh, so let's let's continue on these uh, these questions from Lowell Francis. Given the sheer number of indie games and the diverse play styles and expectations of the crowds coming in, what are the some best practices for introducing more you know, traditional players, more conventional players, people used to, you know, kind of your D&D, your Savage World, uh, Shadowrun, uh, those, those kind of games, introducing those folks to these games? Um, yeah, so one of the things that we try and tell people uh, is that uh, they need to be flexible. Um, we have a, such a, a solid group of hosts because it's important for um, it's important for them to find the people as a as a person walks up and they say, "Hey, I want to play a game. What is this all about?" Uh, one of the first things that our host can do is to sort of feel them out and say, "What uh, what kind of things are you interested in? Do you already play games? If you don't already play games, what kinds of movies or books do you like?" so that we can get a sense of their genre interests. And then we can channel them into the kinds of games that we have. Um, a lot of times, they won't have heard of anything that's on our table. They won't know any of those games. They won't know any of that material. Uh, so instead of saying, oh, well, this is a great D20 system that does X, Y, and Z, we'll say, 
you know, you really like film noir, great. There's a game here that gets into that. We don't worry too much about the system unless they tell us they're interested in that. Uh, we mostly will pitch the idea that it's a it's a game that will probably hit their interests, that the GM is skilled at running it, the GM is full of enthusiasm. Everything they need is going to be on the table. They don't have to bring dice, they don't have to bring pencils, they don't have to bring any knowledge of the game itself. They just hit the table, and in two hours or four hours, they'll have an experience, and they'll have fun. Um, we try and push that line and tell them to be flexible so that they won't show up saying, hey, I heard about Dungeon World, and that's what I'm going to play right now. This is games on demand. I am demanding Dungeon World. We say, well, that's not exactly how it works. Um, we recognize that you're interested in Dungeon World. We don't happen to have an empty slot right now, but these 12 other games are fantastic, and, and they will probably fit your needs. So the demand is you get to say you want a game, and the, the, the game that you get to play is going to be more up to our GMs than it is up to you. But you're going to have a great time. And I very rarely have anybody tell us that we did that wrong. Nice. Ross, do you have anything to add? Is it different for PAX, or do you have a different approach? Um, there are some cultural differences. In the Northwest, there is a really heavy concentration of indie game industry stuff. Uh, there's this profusion of gaming bars and clubs where people go and play role-playing games in public. Um, you know, PAX is just all over. It just takes over Seattle completely. So there is a little bit less of an uh, issue of, uh, you know, pe people, people know about indie games and they're there to have an indie game experience. Um, we use the term story game a lot to refer to what we do instead of role-playing game or other terms. And I found that branding choice to be really useful um, in the Northwest because People come expecting to have, uh, you know, if they, if they haven't played a story game before, they're, they're coming with an open mind. They're not expecting, they're not, they're not expecting something that they're not actually getting. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing that I think is really important when you're playing with new folks is uh, to, we, you know, we have this like little spiel that we like to give before gaming events, and the first, and there's like the three things that we say. The first thing is just that, you know. You, you don't have to be, we're here to create a story together. You don't have to be creative or funny or original. Uh, you know, just say whatever's obvious. And then the second thing is, um, you know, it's, remember, this is a shared storytelling experience we're having together, so it's really important. Just like in a good conversation, you want to make sure you're listening as much as you're talking, uh, maybe even listening a little more than you're talking. And then um, we have, I think it's really important to give people to uh, have a, a kind of social contract. Uh, you know, we'll call it the veil here in the Northwest, or there's, I know you, people use the X card. It's important to make, pe let, make sure that people understand that their emotional and physical safety is more important than any game that they happen to be playing, and everyone's got the power to, uh, to, to ask for the story to go in a different direction or, you know, edit out a piece of content that they're having a hard time with, or even just stop playing if they need to. And um, and I think that that is particularly important when you're playing with folks that are used to playing really competitive games where they have to advocate super hard for themselves. You're either, you're either used to, G to dungeon mastering all the time and just having complete narrative authority, or they're used to being a dungeon map being dungeon mastered and um, just having such a little narrow, tiny piece of impact on the story. Um, so, uh, yeah, those are some social expectations that I like to, you know, establish up front with everyone. Thank you, Ross. Uh, Natalie, did you have anything else you wanted to add from your, uh, your experience? I can't get the meat right. <laughs> Ross <laughs> covered it pretty well. The only other thing I guess we do a little differently is we also... We're a little more, we tend to be just kind of uh, go with a little more maybe, I don't know, like if you want to play Dungeon World, we'd probably be like, okay, we're running Dungeon World at 7. You can come back then. Or I know someone who loves Dungeon World. Let's see if they want to run it right now. <laughs> so we tend to be a little bit like, yeah, let's see what we can do. Um, the only other thing I would say with getting people into a game um, also is if you have the flexibility to kind of take like time and talk to them a little not necessarily be like what genre do you like just like kind of feel them out as a person 
and see what you think they might be into. I like if it's a group of you know younger people, maybe you don't put them, maybe put them with someone who you think would work well with younger kids or something. Just um. Because sometimes people won't even know what they want, but if you're like, oh, they seem like they would get along great with this person, <laughs> then you can end up having a really great game just by matching personalities. So, if it's a if it's a good group, you're gonna have a good game. Tends to be kind of the rule when you're playing an indie RPG, no matter what. So, if all else fails, go with that. Just match make. <laughs> Very cool. Awesome. Uh, all right, um, move to kind of the last on the, the practical side. Uh, there's a question from Marshall Miller. Um, what are the best practices for younger players, especially unaccompanied minors? How do you handle that? Evan, do you, do you want to talk about how that's handled in Origins? Sure. Um, we have a small, uh, a meager kids track. Uh, every year we, we actually talk about collaborating more with, with an actual kids' game room there. And it never quite happens other than us um, handing off uh, a bunch of games that we think will be awesome, Golden Sky stories and that sort of thing. Um, but it, generally what happens is we put them, uh, we, we make sure that the unaccompanied minors are together at, at one table, right? So, so that, that we, 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 and we have a, a GM who wants to do that, who's going to be enthusiastic about that situation. And then I think it, it really is a, a question of matchmaking, as, as Natalie put it up, but really finding that right game that's going to it, it excite the miners, uh, it, as it were. And the other thing is, is everything that they say. I mean, I've run games for, for, for teenagers uh, quite a bit, and, you know, everything that they say is right until it crosses an actual line for you or another player at the table, which means that your story can go in crazy directions, and that's perfectly fine. Um, they're 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 going they're going to go that way. The main thing is that it might be loud, and uh, depending on the age of these minors, you know, if they're in their, their teens, that they should be fine. But if they're below the age of ten, then you also have to be mindful that someone might throw something. So maybe don't um, uh, have throwables at your table for, uh, for for games you're running from people the age of eight to ten, and. Um, and, and, and otherwise, Origins wishes to expand more kid-friendly games, but uh, we, we, I don't say our, our kid-friendly offerings are, are as good um, as they could be. Cool. Kristen, what's your, what's your thoughts on this? Uh, so, yeah, we asked GMs what age uh, groups they're willing to, to handle, um, but one of the things that we want to do with all of our games, not just about kids... <laughs> my cat, <laughs> uh, is once players sit down at the table, uh, just sort of set expectations about what is about to happen. Uh, and then if anybody needs to leave at that point, that they're totally welcome. Um, and it could be because they realize that they sat down at a table where there's going to be a 13-year-old, or it could be because they realize this game is about horror and they don't want horror today, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, so, so one sort of thing to do at the beginning of any game is to sort of say, like, here's what we're about to do, and here's the people we're about to do it with, and if you need to leave for any reason, that's totally cool, we'll find you another game, you're not breaking anything. Um, so I, th I think when working with, with kids, that might be especially important if you end up with a kid at your table as a GM. Um, but they can be really awesome. I ran a game of Danger Patrol for this, like, eight-year-old, and everyone was so patient with her, as she was slowly, like, reading things, and everyone at the table was on board and I signed up for that and at this one point there was this gorilla and she's like trying to get rid of him and she's like I dress myself up like a banana and run that way <laughs> it was just it was beautiful uh, and like everyone being on on the board at the table uh, made that happen so yeah it's, it's great that's pretty great uh, Steve, I understand that you might have a little bit of a record for the games on demand GM uh, age range there yeah, uh, well, one thing I'll say real quick is that the scale that we've talked about uh, that the different shows have makes a big difference to what you can get away with. I think, uh, as Natalie was saying, they can be a lot more flexible at the size that PAX is, uh, taking things out of turn. And I think that applies to sh what they're trying to do at Origins, where they can put a bunch of kids together at a table. We've experimented a lot with it at Gen Con and have found that... Um, we, can, we can target certain age ranges, but... Uh, it's hard for us to isolate out space so that so that kids can have a nice quiet game without somebody at the next table yelling curse words 
uh, we've had a little bit of a challenge there. So we've tried to let people know that the room is generally maybe 10 plus, 13 plus in terms of its overall quality, and that maybe we can pull a kid off somewhere else. I remember uh, Jim Crocker a few years ago had three preteen girls sitting down and playing Lady Blackbird in the hallway on the floor, and they had a great time, right? So that's a way that we can accommodate it, but it, it it's not always the easiest to make it work. Um, I think one of the, what you're implying, what you're talking about with the GM is uh, uh, Jason Morningstar's nephew has been coming for the last two years. He's 14 now, and he he's designing his own games. Uh, he showed up at Gen Con to run his first Gen Con. He sat down and, play, and ran Fiasco for adults. Uh, he's he's a trooper and he's really sharp. But at the same time, we want to make sure that the players know what they're getting into. So we put it on the menu this kid is 14 years old and he's going to be running a game for you. So, you know, set your expectations appropriately. Uh, and also letting him know that there are people around him that can support him. If he gets into trouble, we try and check in on him periodically. He waves us away like we're bothering him. But, you know, we've, we've got others who came in and started playing with their parents when they were 15 and they came back year after year until now they're, uh, I think, Giovanni is 19 now. I can't quite remember, but he's now one of our full-time GMs, and he's dragged his dad in to be a GM. So, you know, it's it, there's a bit of a, a generational thing happening, which is really exciting. I will say that it's uh, I had a bad experience a few years ago where I was running Carolina Death Crawl for a table full of people, and a man sat down with his 10-year-old son to play this game, and I tried to explain to him right up front that this is a game about murdering people and doing terrible things, destroying things, and maybe it's not appropriate for him. And his dad just looked at me and said, he's fine. And at that point, as a GM, and this is what I've told every GM at every show since, I should have said, no, he might be fine, but I'm not. I'm not going to run this game for a 10-year-old. And I didn't do that. And it was very uncomfortable for me for the, for the whole course of the game. So I think it's, um, you know, we try and make sure that the GMs feel empowered to control those situations and make it a safe place, not just for all the players, but for the younger players. Good answer. Thanks for sharing that, Steve. That sounds rough. All right, uh, so I, this this may wrap us up here as we've come up on the hour. Um, Epistolary Richard asks, as Richard Williams asks, Games on Demand is heavily associated with indie RPGs. Was Games on Demand a way to get indie RPGs into conventions that were otherwise resistant to including them in their main schedule? And are you now seeing more indie RPGs in the con's main schedule, or have they remained limited to Games on Demand? Evan, did you want to kick this one off? Sure. Um, I think the origins of Games on Demand itself kind of come up in this question. Um, at Origins, we actually just had a program track tag that uh, Kat and Michael Miller started in, I think it was 2006, 2007, called Indie Games Explosion. And we're still called Indie Games Explosion uh, if you look carefully in Origins program. Um, that track has not gone away. Um, Indie Games Explosion was a way for us who were otherwise running random indie games to organize, and then Games on Demand itself emerged out of that infrastructure um, where we said, okay, well, what, it, why submit everything on a program and then have everybody um, kind of closed off from each other make their decisions um, uh, and, and not know about any other indie game designers or players when we could just put up a whiteboard and organize. And that was, that was sort of the, the moment at Origins where that happened. But it's important to, to say that when you organize through a conventional convention schedule, um, you're matchmaking with, with players you know, months in advance. Um, they're, they're making their decisions with blinders on, not knowing about any larger community. And usually people in the know find the games. You sit down, you're usually playing them with the same group of people, people who know about indie games, and um, that's that. Games on Demand opens up the audience. It opens up the potential for people who are not experienced with these games to come in, for random groups, for, for celebrity designers to come and drop in on a game. All of these opportunities that are missed when you have to put something really far in advance on a convention schedule. And I would say that you're seeing about the same number of indie games as... as there are sort of games out there. I mean, I think they're increasing on convention schedules because, frankly, um, Apocalypse World and Fiasco and other 
uh, blockbusters are a thing, right, at, at, at this point, just like Shadowrun used to be a thing. But uh, in, in other case, I would say on, on main convention schedules, what we now have is a larger diversity of events that offer um, games uh, from, from the indie game set. Um, so, so, it did, so it's not just games on demand anymore. Cool. Uh, Renee, did you have anything to add from your experience? You know, it's, it's really hard to improve upon what, what Evan just said, um, but it does kind of, I did kind of want to tie it back in to what we talked about with branding earlier. Um, Games on Demand definitely has this this history and this focus on on indie RPGs, and and I've actually seen game masters at our Origins and Gen Con events turned to, who were told, no, you can't run Pathfinder. You know that's that game doesn't need any more exposure at this con. Let's do something else. Um, but then one of the things that, like I talked about, how UConn is going to be a little bit different. That's not necessarily. Um, a limitation at UConn. That's one of the ways that um, its complexion is going to be a little bit different. And uh, I even I jumped into that, you know, with, uh, you know, I'm running some more traditional games at UConn um, because of its different complexion. So, um, and you also get into a, the place, too, where what's, what's indie and what's not. Call of Cthulhu probably isn't, but is Trail of Cthulhu? We definitely let people run Gumshoe and Gumshoe derivative games at um, our various conventions. So, and let is a pretty strong word anyway. It's, you know, we don't actually hover over people and, and ban games or anything, but we definitely encourage uh, certain directions. So, that's that. That's what I had to say. <laughs> I thought that running Dungeon Crawl Classic a little scandalous, Renee. Oh, yeah, completely scandalous. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's like... Uh, yeah, I don't know what to say about Dungeon Crawl Classics. I felt like uh, there was a need for something that felt traditional, but that clearly, but that still fit within the parameters of uh, of games on demand. Plus, it's just a, a hell of fun game. So, um, yeah, it was. Uh, it's one of those things where I feel like um, we have, we do, we might have a lot of Apocalypse World games, might have a lot of Fate games. Um, Probably there's an audience for the OSR, too, that isn't being served at Games on Demand traditionally, and I kind of wanted to uh, pitch in and support that a little bit. So, Very cool. Awesome. Ross, what about you? Did you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah, I did have something to add. I'm just like, I'm, do we have a hipster problem? Are we just a bunch of hipsters? I don't know. Like, I worry yes. about, like, because, like, we, we're, this is it's called Games on Demand, and all convention along, along, people are coming up to you, and they're like, oh, it's Games on Demand. And we're like, okay, we know it's called Games on Demand, but it's actually this other thing, you know? And, and we kind of decide, it's, it's clear when you're inside the culture, and this is why I call it a hipster problem, because it's clear when you're inside the culture what is part of the culture and what is not part of the culture, but for people on the outside, they don't really know what the rules are, and so... You know, some poor guy will come up and be like, "Hey, I want to run like Pathfinder here. Is that cool?" And everyone's just like, "Oh, oh, oh Pathfinder. I'm sorry, that's not an indie game." On and they're like, "What? It's Pathfinder. It's owned by Piazza. Yes, yes, yes." But you know, and it just it becomes this thing. I don't know. It's uh, it's I don't have an answer. It's just it's a a problem that cultures have, which is part of what's beautiful about Games on Demand and why we all love it. It's because it's a community and. Um, you know, I, when like my low, one of my lowest moments that happens to me every PAX is I have to like kick all these poor nerds that come when all the uh, uh, when all the tabletop open, the pre-play tabletop tables fill up and they want to come and they can play their board game or play Magic. You know, they'll, they'll come and sit down and try and play a game. I'll be like, oh, sorry, this is for games on demand. And they're like, oh, but yeah, but these are games. I'm like, yeah, but not those games. And then like you know. Luke Crane will come and he'll sit down and start playing Swords and Strongholds with somebody and I'm not going to kick Luke Crane off of his table. He'd like breathe fire and destroy me. I'd be gone, you know. Uh, you know, so it's it, it, and it, and no one thinks twice about it because it's this is really clearly a person that's a part of our culture. Um, so yeah, I think there is I think the branding of games on demand I, I would give it a C if I was the professor of 
whatever. <laughs> awesome. Uh, Steve, what, what are your thoughts on, uh, on the question here about indie RPGs? Yeah, we, we usually tell people, well, first of all, the, the Games on Demand branding is um, it, it's an historical problem, right? We, we labeled it that way a long time ago. I don't remember if we had it before or after Microsoft took it over and made it a thing, but it's a confusion point. Uh, people, op- you know, we, we've had to teach people what it actually means because it doesn't, it's not obvious. But changing that branding at this point, as Renee has pointed out, it carries a lot of weight now at the various shows. So changing it at this point is a bit of a problem. So the best thing that we can do is, uh, again, sort of educating people as to what it means and to be open and welcoming. One of the advantages that we have with the organization, the, the pre-event organization that we do at Origins and uh, Gen Con, is that we're talking to the GMs ahead of time and saying, these are, are good parameters for choosing your game. Try to pick things that are not going to be overrepresented elsewhere at the show. If there's a, there's a giant room of, full of Pathfinder at Gen Con, if you want a Pathfinder game, you can find it. So we don't need to have that in, in our space. Unless somebody's going to run some really crazy Pathfinder variant set in India, you know, like, though that sounds cool, let's do that. Um, it's really up to the GM. We want what they're enthusiastic about, but we also want them to try and choose things that are unusual or, you know, edgy. It doesn't have to be indie, indie necessarily, just new and interesting. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's all I need to say on that. Cool. Thanks, Steve. I, I appreciate that. Um, that's... It's a good point of view. I always always wonder, like, such rules are going to show up here? It's kind of indie. <laughs> Sorry. Well, All right. That's the thing, right? Who gets to decide, you know, who, who decides what belongs in the club and what doesn't belong in the club? Yep. I guess each individual organizer of that, that cons games on demand, right? Isn't yeah. that how it goes? And, and, and again, some of it is dependent on context, right? So if you're at Gen Con... Everybody there knows what a role-playing game is. You don't have to explain that to them. Most of them already know about a huge selection of games, and so they're coming to it with a lot of their own biases, and you have to maybe un- redirect them into what we're actually running. But at PAX East, and I assume at PAX Prime, you're getting a lot of people who not only don't know what a role-playing game is, but they don't know what tabletop games are. They are they have a video game background at best, and they walk up and they, they say, what is this? My experience at PAX East is that they're full of enthusiasm and they want to do something fun. So all you have to say is, you know, come over here. We are, you know, we're doing tabletop role-playing games, pen and paper. You know, make sure that they're really clear about what they're about to sit down and do. And they usually jump right on board. They may know what Dungeons & Dragons is, but otherwise it's an open field. And I think that that part has been really exciting in the past is finding those people and, and introducing them to something that they're going to have a lot of fun with. And in those contexts what you're running kind of doesn't matter. Uh, whether it's, you know, a big publisher, in, middle publisher, independent game, those people, it's all new to them. Cool, cool. I'm glad that you never you never said, like, if it's been on Will Wheaton's tabletop, it doesn't count. That would be that would be a detrimental yeah. thing. For right, students. that would be a problem. Yeah. yeah. Natalie, did you have anything to add on? Oh, yeah, no, Steve kind of said it. I guess my I always figure, you know... If you if it if you want to run something and people want to play it, that's the most important. We don't usually have people come up f- trying to play Pathfinder, but I'm not going to debate like, is this indie enough? Is this enough of a RPG? Like, <laughs> and really get into evaluating it on that level. It's just like this isn't made by Pies or Wizards of the Coast, <laughs> or you know. <laughs> And uh, you want to give up your time and, like, help people learn to play games. I think that's the most important part. So just take it on a case-by-case basis. And, like, I would say don't stress too much about it if you feel, like, don't feel like you're destroying any indie cred, I guess. Yeah. (laughs) Because the people who care about it are honestly probably watching it right this right now. Most people don't. I don't know. (laughs) That sounds bad. That's not what I I don't mean that like indie games are bad. We do run most like pretty much all indie games. But if you're like, well, this one sold this many units, I don't know. Have fun. Awesome. 
that's great. I, I, we definitely, you guys should have a measuring stick of sales, and I don't know. That uh. doesn't sound good at all. <laughs> well, we have come up to our hour, and I, uh, I got to say, uh, hopefully everyone got their questions answered. I didn't see any Q and A come live through the hangout, so you've missed your opportunity. But a very big thanks uh, to all of you, Evan, Kristen, Natalie, Renee, Ross, and Steve. Thank you all so much for lending us your expertise and teaching us about games on demand. Thanks to everybody who submitted questions. Uh, we really appreciate that. Now, if you enjoyed this panel, uh, before I let everybody go, but if you enjoyed it and you want to know more Indie Plus stuff, the Indie Plus is you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's at some point below where my hand is gone. Uh, and you can click on a button and it will magically subscribe you to our YouTube channel. And again, last time, Google Plus community, uh, we would love to have you there. We have a, a pledge drive going on. We're going to release a cool little Halloween anthology of some supplements, uh, lots of cool things there. So please do check that out. Again, Evan, Kristen, uh, Natalie, Renee, Ross, and Steve, thank you all so much for coming on. I really appreciate having you on. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. Cool. Have a good night. Good night.